Just wanted to mention from a climate standpoint, it makes no sense to provide a system that encourages single occupant driving and that a far more climate appropriate solution would be congestion pricing of the entire freeway so that everybody paid a price and that that would therefore um, uh, serve to reduce demand for driving alone. Um, driving alone is the biggest environmental impact and it's, it's the biggest generator of GHGs in the Bay Area. If we're not directly providing an incentive to not do that, we're not accomplishing our goals. Right, and so, so, so David's absolutely right. And, and that's the problem with MTC, our regional agency's current proposal, is that it doesn't have a goal in mind of, for example, increasing the average number of people in cars. And if it's done poorly, like David's mentioning, it could actually decrease it by giving people that are currently carpooling a way out of that. And so we've got to be much more strategic, set these goals, um, like increasing average vehicle occupancy, reducing climate emissions, and then only implementing if it meets that, uh, not just doing it because we can and other regions are. And so that's the kind of outcome-oriented planning that SB 375 supports, but there's still a lot of details that are left up to the regions that we can really mess up. Um, and so we are hoping that this congestion pricing, uh, again, is done in a way that both provides more transportation choices, and we want to see an analysis that we call an equity analysis that low-income communities need to benefit as a whole. Um, these have been termed Lexus lanes, and to some degree they are. Those are going to be some number of yep. people. But we've also you know, seen in other regions that lower-income folks are using it. But the real question is, on a whole, could we reduce costs for low-income riders overall by providing them those choices, by maybe reducing the cost of transit in those corridors as part of the implementation? Um, and I think of, you, know, you brought up taxes, and can, taxes are going to have to go up as part of it, and that's likely true. Taxes and fees may have to go up. But again, we have to look at people's total outlays of what they're spending on things like transportation and housing, and not how much comes through you know, uh, the government and how much comes through Exxon Mobil, Toyota, Ford. Uh, because right now, in the Bay Area, our public agencies are spending about $4 billion a year on transportation. Commuters, all of us you know, in this room and listening on the radio and TV, are spending $31 billion a year directly to General Motors and Exxon, and uh, as well as the local repair shop. Um, and so if we could invest a little bit more in transit, uh, invest a little bit more in giving people options, car share, other things that can make it easier for people to drive less and possibly some of them reduce their vehicle ownership, as a region, we can actually reduce our total transportation costs, even if some government fees go up. Um, and that's, again, the kind of analysis we have to show people um, if we're going to win over their support. We've got a great report called Windfall for All that actually shows that out of that 31 um, billion, if all Bay Area residents had access to transit that was as good as the best 20% of residents, we could reduce that cost, that personal cost, by about 10 billion, by about 30%. And so we've got to get those arguments out there and, and show the evidence that it can really work. And typical household, I don't know if you said this, pays about 20% of their annual uh, budget on, on transportation costs. That was Stuart Cohen, executive director of Transform. As a report, uh, are you, the members of the Association of Bay Area Governments, elected officials, are they going to go for congestion pricing, uh, tax increases to, uh, to fund the kind of infrastructure we've been talking about? We've got to wrap it up here soon. Well, I, I think when you look at the land uses in the Bay Area, it's very hard to get to most places by transit. And that's not likely to change because we've built a society and it's auto dependent. Um, so trying to tax your way or trying to tax mobility isn't going to be a solution that resonates with uh, local governments or most of the communities of the Bay Area. It might work in San Francisco where you do have a transit system, but it, it's not going to work in most of the region. I don't think that's the right place to start. I think the right place to start is with the partnership with local governments, regional agencies, and, and the environmental communities about what is our vision and how do we think we can implement it, what are the things that are, that are low-hanging fruit that's easy for us to do. Um, and then once we're able to get through a, a good foundation of that kind of work and look at our infrastructure needs, et cetera, then I think a case can be made to the public to about better rationalizing how we spend public money as well as what additional monies we might need. 
Last word, Mike Kilmetti. Do you think we're going to be able to, do you think that more public money needs to be forthcoming to make these kinds of things happen? I don't know if it's more public company, I think a better allocation of public money. Um, it may be more, um, but, but I, think, I think a better allocation of how we're spending our money. And I, and I think the public-private partnerships could add a lot to it. Again, the development community um, has, has been responsible for putting in a lot of infrastructure around the Bay Area and can be part of the solution. Not voluntarily. Government's made you do it, right? Um, yep. It's part of the package. Part of the package is, is mitigating uh, the impacts that, that, uh, that, that, that we create. And so uh, that mitigation package is putting in some of that infrastructure. How much of the development that you have in the pipeline now is transit-oriented development? When you look out what you're going to build in the future, how much of it is, is transit-friendly uh, building? Um, well, by broader definition, if transit is all transit, not BART per se, which a lot of people non -auto, are rail. Non-auto, I guess, yeah. I'd say, you know, well more than 50%, probably 60, 70%.